So across Instagram, they post just like us. They pose just like us. They write bios and captions and content just like us. There's really very little to distinguish them from real humans when you're scrolling through a feed quickly like that. Except they're not real. They're made by teams of writers, riggers, engineers, creatives, art directors. They're modeled, textured, rigged, lit, posed to create content and build a brand. And people feel extremely connected to them. This definitely sums it up. But we're talking more than just Instagram posts here. We are talking big brand deals. So Lil Michaela up there has actually collaborated with brands and celebrities such as Calvin Klein, Prada, YouTube Music, and Samsung Galaxy. So here she is on the Team Galaxy campaign alongside human influencers. She's even on Spotify with hit songs with millions of streams. So this is much bigger than just images on Instagram. In fact, 42% of Gen Z and millennials have followed an influencer and didn't know it was CGI, according to a study by Fullscreen. CGI influencers, published by humans. Now let's talk about VTubers. So VTubers, virtual YouTubers. What are VTubers? So VTubers, virtual YouTubers, are social media personalities who prefer to publish to social platforms as an avatar, 2D or 3D character, as opposed to you know, their human likeness. They're commonly puppeteered, or we would say driven, by humans in the background. The lines overlap, a CGI influencer, a VTuber, it's very blurry. Certain people will probably call me out in this language and say it's either or. But there's definitely this sense of a VTuber often has someone in the background driving, a real human back there. But it's probably easier if I just show you. This is the National Museum of Science and Innovation, and it's full of fascinating science stuff. I am so excited to be here. I've been making videos all over the place. What's up, fam? Today, we are going to try something new, something different. Hello, welcome. It's your favorite sentient artificial being. So, mm -hmm, I'll let you take that in for a second. So when did all this start? Well. It's worth calling out that we've, we've used puppets uh, in, in storytelling for thousands of years, so this isn't exactly a new concept. And there's been many creative devs, especially on YouTube over the years, where people have used digital characters for storytelling and elements like that. But VTubing as we see it today, and particularly like the videos you just saw there, it really owes a lot to the breakout success of one particular star. So the year is 2016. Enter Kazuna Ai. Kazuna posts her first video on December 1st, 2016, and it sets off a ripple and brings up a wave, a whole generation of VTubers. She's a self-described artificial intelligence who exists in our world, and she's easily the most popular VTuber to date. Let's take a look. Hi, virtual YouTuber Kizuna Ai. It's So, massive audience sizes. People love Kazuna Ai. She's got 2.67 million subs on her primary channel and around even a little more now, 1.4 million on just her game streaming channel. So when you go through Tokyo, it's not uncommon to see her on billboards, posters, merchandises, live concerts. Now it's worth calling out that in Japan, there's a history of anime, manga, Vocaloid, Virtual Idol, Hatsune Miku. This is, these ideas have been around for a while, so it was the perfect kind of hotbed for this craze to take place. And with that content, it seems like a very logical progression for it to move to a platform like YouTube. But let's fast forward to 2020. So where are VTubers at now? Well, it's quite a different landscape. So in 2017, the landscape was predominantly Japanese creators. It's very much started in Japan. However, fast forward, and those early creators have inspired a whole new generation of VTubers around the world. These VTubers, uh, historically, VTubers were very anime-centric in their styling, but now we see VTubers in a whole spectrum of characters, from simple 2D cartoons all the way through to hyper-realistic models. And so many people ask me when I present on this topic, they go, but Anthony, these are just kind of animations, aren't they? Aren't these just kind of cartoons? This isn't that new. We've had this on YouTube for a long time. And to a degree, they're right, but there's a fundamental difference here. And that is the interesting thing about VTubers is that they actually want to be seen as a counterpart to their human YouTubers. So they don't want to be seen as any different. 
and they essentially view themselves as exactly the same, and they're really trying to emulate the style that's been popularized over the last decade by human YouTubers. So when we talk about like what kind of content are they creating, game streams, uh, live streams, live streaming, music and song and dance videos, educational tutorials, even unboxing and paid product reviews. So there's no content that a VTuber isn't going to try and take on that their human counterparts can do. Now this is where it gets really interesting. So we obviously see a lot of creator trends on YouTube, you know, viral trends and memes. And there was a time where YouTube creators were buying a very particular um, brand of spicy noodle, instant kind of noodles. And then they would eat this and record the reaction, right? So not to be outdone, the VTubers were like, okay, well, we've got to do this as well. And so they would get these noodles kind of modeled up in 3D and then eat the spicy noodles themselves. Now, obviously, that caused a whole realm of problems. The AI um, VTubers were just kind of like, well, I can't even taste anything, so why is this interesting? So, I mean, many of them played on it in their own different way, but they're not to be outdone. They want to be seen alongside other YouTubers. When I was traveling through Tokyo in 2018, I was very fortunate enough to be able to attend the Nico Nico Cho party. So in Japan, Nico Nico is kind of like our YouTube, and they throw a big party where they have a stage show for all their creators to perform. Now, um, it's very small, but on the stage there, you can see it's actually Kazuna Ai. There's a hologram being projected, and this is an enthusiastic audience singing and dancing along to every single song. This is tens of thousands of people. This is a very passionate audience base. So it's much bigger than just YouTube. Even though they're virtual YouTubers, they've really leapt out of YouTube in recent years. They're now on Twitter, Twitch, TikTok, Instagram, you name it. Just like a human influencer, they understand that they have to kind of maintain a brand across multiple platforms. Being on one is not going to be enough. But so why do they do it? Why do they choose the avatar as opposed to their human likeness? Well, there's a number of different reasons. For some, it's fun. It's a creative expression. They say to me that, uh, there's things I can create, there's content I can create as a VTuber that I wouldn't be able to create as a human. Uh, for some, it's convenience. If any of you have ever tried you know, uh, posting content to YouTube in your home, you often have to set up a whole studio. There's lights, there's gear, there's cameras, it's expensive, and it's quite time consuming. So many VTubers tell me, I don't even need to do my hair and makeup. I can stay in my pajamas in bed and record all my game streams. This is very convenient for me. For some, it is anonymity. Now, that's either because they don't feel comfortable being in front of a camera, or they come from a cultural context where it actually wouldn't be safe for them to be publishing on social media uh, with the message that they want to tell. So for some, that's very important. Now, the, one of the most interesting here is brand strategy. And this is really emerging very quickly. Brands are turning and starting to experiment with VTubing. And I'll tell you why. It's because a VTuber is 100% brand safe. They don't sleep. They don't eat. They don't get tired. They don't get cranky. They don't need to be managed. They never kind of get drunk and go on a racist Twitter tirade. They're perfectly brand safe. They also allow brands to experiment very quickly. They'll send VTubers into new content categories to try things out. And if it's successful, they can send the humans in. But it means they can experiment a lot more quickly and not kind of damage the reputation of their human influencers. So this is quite interesting to watch how this evolves. So we've talked about why people choose to VTube, but why do people watch? It, it, interestingly, it's not that different from the reasons that people watch YouTubers. They want to be entertained, informed, inspired. However, there's something definitely unique to VTubing, and, and this is kind of my hypothesis on it. So there's a form of play here that isn't present when you watch normal YouTubers. I think watching VTuber content tends to be a little bit more participatory. You're kind of buying into this illusion. You're suspending disbelief that there's a grander narrative at play here where this character exists in our world. When the video is over and the upload's complete, they leave and they go to their Twitter and they post there and they talk to fans and they interact with other VTubers. And there's this kind of narrative that plays out through the week between videos and it's almost like the characters from your favorite show have jumped into the world and they're here with us. Now that's a very enticing, a very fun game to play along with. But it comes with it a social contract that I've noticed. And th there's kind of two rules to this. So the first one is for the VTubers. You gotta stay in character. There's almost this unwritten rule where it's like you don't break character and you never say you don't exist. Now many different VTubers have different ways of getting around this. Some say I'm from another planet. Some say I'm an artificial intelligence. Some say I'm a simulation. Some just flat out say I'm real. What are you talking about? So therefore the other rules obviously for the fans. They have to play along. Fans are expected to suspend disbelief to be in on the gag, and then to defend the character and the narrative in the comments, to shepherd new users into the community. You'll see people come into the live stream for the first time and say, what is this? Is this person even real? And the fans are like, of course she's real. What are you talking about? That's all part of this kind of form of play, this grand narrative that's playing out. So the interesting thing here, though, 
is that novelty brings people in. People see this in the feed, they're like, what is that? But personality keeps them there. Authenticity is key. So I think more than ever with cancel culture, things like this, we're seeing that audiences are demanding authenticity of their influences more than ever before. The repercussions are big. And actually for VTubers, it's really no different. It's almost like an unwritten agreement between fans and VTubers. Okay, we'll play along, we'll accept that you're real, but you gotta give us the whole package. We're not gonna take anything less. And this has resulted in some really interesting cases where kind of VTubers have forgotten their own personal history, and they've said things like, oh, you know, my favorite movie is this. And the fans are like, last week you said your favorite movie was that. Like, what's going on here? And then they've really come at them. So the VTubers are saying, we don't even have the tools to write our own history down to remember this stuff on the fly. So it's bringing up lots of new challenges for these creators. So we have CGI influences, and you could say they're published by humans. And we have VTubers, and you could say they're driven by humans. It's a loose terminology. But it brings us to this third flavor, autonomous virtual beings. So I think when people talk about virtual beings or when they hear that I'm going to talk about this, this is kind of what they think of. They think of the Hollywood vision. You know, They think of a character that's driven by AI that I could speak to very naturally, and it could use kind of AI to decide how it would interact back with me. You could imagine that for an influencer, this would be a character with whom I could ask questions or watch content and, and maybe the way they speak or their accent or their look or their hair color would all be personalized just for me in the way that I would find the most engaging. It might remember everything I've ever said to it and weave that back into jokes or stories that it tells me. But let's bring it back to reality for a second. We are very much in the realm and in the era of VTubers. The next part of this talk, we're gonna look at what would it actually mean to make the jump over to autonomous virtual beings. So I wanted to pick out three technological areas, not the only three, but three where I think they're kind of interesting to share and where there's been some really amazing, fantastic progress recently. So they are avatar diversity, real-time rendering, and content generation. So one of the biggest pain points, if you, if you were interested in starting VTubing that you would come up against is like, you can't find a good avatar or you can't find one that you feel represents you. Now, I don't know how many of you are 3D modelers, but it's really, really hard. <laughs> and it's quite a, a stumbling block for many uh, wannabe VTubers. So there are different kind of groups that are looking at how to go about creating a really expressive and unique but dynamic avatar to kind of bootstrap this industry. So here we have uh, the Facebook Reality Labs. So they've been working on uh, kind of hyper-realistic real-time virtual avatars. So you can see there they're wearing the VR headsets. So they're using cameras to actually watch the eye and face and mouth movements, and then using that kind of facial motion data to drive the models that you're seeing on either side, which is pretty amazing. Now, we obviously know we've got generative adversarial networks, so GANs. Uh, more than ever in the era of deep fakes, this stuff is coming for us this year, even it's already here. So we can now create thousands of hyper-realistic photorealistic faces on demand. This is an infinite number of skins for the potential future VTubers. There's actually a, uh, an artificial intelligence company in Japan called Datagrid who recently produced full body deep fakes. Now you can imagine if you're an influencer, one of the big things for you is clothing. You need to look fresh for the posts every weekend. So here's an infinitely large wardrobe for you to be able to use for your content. And a few weeks ago in uh, Las Vegas at CES, and Neon, which is, uh, sorry, Star Labs, the subsidiary of Samsung, released the Neon project. It's kind of this mysterious artificial human project they were working on. And they revealed a, a cast of hyper-realistic digital humans that you'll be able to interact with in the future. So, real-time rendering. If these virtual beings are going to be performing and in real-time media and engaging with us, we're going to need to work on how to render them in the moment. So, fortunately, there's been some truly phenomenal advances in this space. So here I'm gonna show you the Siren project. So this was created uh, for a presentation at SIGGRAPH in 2018 uh, to show what's possible using the Unreal Engine. So it's a combination of tech from multiple teams working together to bring this to life. But I think it's easier if I just show you. Hello, I'm Siren and I'm a digital human. I was created by an international team of artists and engineers who wanted to challenge our ideas of what a synthetic human could be. So I think when you look behind the scenes, it's even more impressive. So this isn't motion capture that's being taken and then sent you know, to the studio for months and months and months of post work. This is happening live. This is truly phenomenal. However, I think what's interesting here is the hardware that's being developed for the Siren project is quite extensive and, and it's professional grade, it's top of state of the art. But here's 
a gentleman from Kite and Lightning. He's showing you just how far you can push the same technology using a mocap suit and an iPhone X strapped to a helmet. So this technology is rapidly being democratized. So this will no longer be just in the realm of SFX studios and Hollywood budgets. Soon, anybody will be able to do this in their lounge room like this gentleman here. And you can see the fidelity and look at the facial motion that that's producing. Pretty amazing stuff. OK, so finally, now we have these huge, diverse cast of avatars. And we have real-time rendering so we can engage with them in real time. They're going to need some content to talk to us about. So you, uh, some of you may remember uh, earlier in maybe 2018 or 19, uh, OpenAI actually refused to release their text generator algorithm, GP2, uh, GPT-2. Uh, and they said it was too dangerous. It's going to be weaponized. It'll be used for nefarious means. Well, jokes, now it's out. So uh, that's concerning, I guess. But they did find that there was, they actually kind of retracted that statement and said they actually don't believe maybe there's that much cause for concern. So now we have an algorithm that can read and summarize text and then produce new content for us. That would be very good if you started to think of that as a script writing tool. But we're probably just missing one final piece of the puzzle. And here it is. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. I love the smell of French toast in the morning. So what's actually happening here is I research love the smell from a of napalm in the morning. Sorry, can we mute that just for thanks? Um, this is recent research published in 2019 demonstrating new technologies to puppeteer a face based on the text that's fed into it. So it's worth calling out that the audio that you're hearing has actually been recorded by the research team. So they're not using voice synth, but you can see the lips are actually moving to the new text. So now, heck, we have hyper-realistic avatars that are rendered in real time who now can be fed a massive script of information, and we can drive and puppeteer them just based on the text that we're feeding them. It's kind of scary, I think. However, the, even though the tech is being democratized and we've moved from that kind of Hollywood studio tech to just an iPhone camera, you know, we're still not really that close to that kind of futuristic sci-fi vision that we kind of looked at before. So you could say that we've recently kind of crossed that uncanny valley of photorealism. So we're scrolling through our feeds and we can no longer detect which ones are the composite humans and which ones are the real ones. But we're now encountering brand new problems. We're encountering problems of orchestration, of um, choreography, realistic movements, things you would expect a human in a way you would expect them to move or react in certain circumstances, emotional sentiment uh, detection, memory. Can these things actually remember everything that you've ever said like you would expect uh, you know, a friend or confidant to? So even though we now have these very realistic looking characters, we're actually encountering potentially new challenges. But this is where I think it kind of gets interesting. So we've talked about these autonomous virtual beings, but what does this mean in this context of social media influences? Well, it means that we may end up with autonomous virtual influences. And like any new technology, there's a lot of implications about this. So, I mean, I think the pros is that it's probably going to give more people a voice than ever before. And there are a number of people all over the world who find themselves in situations where they're not able to participate online, in social, in community discussions in the way that we are. And this may enable uh, those people to have a voice. It also really challenges our notions of relationships with digital assistants. Many of the digital assistants that you would interact with in your day to day, it's a very master-slave kind of relationship. The assistant exists to uh, effectively read your calendar. But you would have a very different relationship with some of these characters if you were engaging with them in your day to day life. So that's exciting to explore. However, on the kind of the con side there, uh, the possibilities for this being weaponized across social media for disinformation campaigns and fake news is kind of evident. And I'm sure you've already arrived at that same kind of conclusion. You could imagine uh, you know, having a particular political ideology, writing up your manifesto around that, being able to distribute it across a scaled system of thousands of these avatars who can ingest that script, turn it into their content, and then post that to various social channels. Uh, the sheer volume of that that could be constructed is probably on a level we haven't seen before and we're not really adequately equipped to deal with. You know, when I've kind of brought that up, uh, and not to be too grim, people have said to me, but you know, uh, we've got this uh, deep fake detection coming out. You know, we're going to be able to tell when a video has been manipulated. We'll put a little strap line underneath that says, uh, you know, we think this has been some modification in the video. The interesting thing when I talk to the audience, uh, the viewers of this content, they love this content because it's digitally manipulated. That's like an art form for them. So when we warn people in the future and say, hey, this video may actually be an artificial human, I mean, young people might say, of course it is. I love this. why I'm here to watch it. You know? So that may not necessarily be enough of a measure to protect us. So 
So what does this mean? I think this means we could be in for some really interesting new ideas about media. So we have traditional media, and let's talk a little bit about what new video media might be like with this kind of technology. So today, traditional media, it's pre-baked, it's one size fits all. It's very high quality though, very well produced. But it's passive, and you know, when you sit down to watch a, a show on, on any of your favorite streaming services, uh, the show doesn't know who's watching it. However, you could imagine potentially a new uh, style of media where because you know, interactive characters like virtual beings uh, run in a game engine, and game engines are exceptionally good at, at receiving a bunch of input, you could imagine a, a new type of very participatory or interactive kind of media, so one that is kind of hyper-personalized uh, to you. So the, the video may be slightly generative. Characters may speak in a certain way or with a certain dialect. Uh, they might make one joke over another, all based on your preferences and how you've interacted with other media in the past. Ultimately, I think what we're looking at is potentially a very unique uh, experience. So, you know, today we have this idea of like, you know, here's a, here's a creator and they create a piece of media and then we all consume the media. And it's pretty straightforward, right? We're very familiar with this model. And, you know, if you share a video with me because you think it's funny and you say, hey, you really enjoy this, I, maybe I find it funny. And we have this shared connection over that single piece of media because we know that we were both watching the same thing. However, if we move to this model where, you know, a creator produces an instance of media as opposed to like, you know, an asset of media and the instance is hyper-personalized and dynamic, then you're shifting from a one-to-many kind of relationship to this kind of one-to-one. -one. And I don't know. I don't know if we really know what we think about that yet. So when you share that video with me, what are you sharing? Because the video I'm going to see might be different from the video you're going to see. Are we now subscribing and liking and following a, a personality or an algorithm as opposed to a, a piece of art or, or a digital medium? So I think we just are really not sure what this is going to look like. But we do know that if it's going to be about hyper-personalization, we're going to see some sort of feedback loop that would be like this. And this is like really interesting to just try and think about. Because going forward, virtual beings are going to be far more sophisticated at using data to refine their performances than humans will. So the viewer's input and their passive response will inform the performance, which will then custom tailor it back to make a very enticing piece of media for the viewer. So you can imagine that a character is giving a speech, or there's a drama playing out, or it's a comedy, or maybe the movie asks a question of you in an interactive piece of fiction. Now, what you say to the movie, how you say it, where you're looking, are you gazing at that character or that character? Did you laugh at the punchline or did you frown at the punchline? Were you offended by that or was that enjoyable? All of these pieces of data, whether they're explicit choices, like you're clicking a menu item, to whether you kind of had a micro twitch and smile at a off-colored joke will inform the performance engine and that will be custom tailored on the fly to deliver you to. It's quite an interesting idea to think about what this would mean for some of the media we consume today. So this leads us back to this concept of influence. And I mean, personally, I think very shortly, very soon, we're going to have to have a conversation about this. We're going to have to have a conversation about who we're comfortable influencing us. We're going to have to have a conversation about how much transparency are we comfortable with having about the people who influence us. Even today, we, we grapple with understanding who are the true motivators and sponsors and instigators behind the human influences in our feeds. Who's really driving things back there? This is going to be increasingly difficult with another layer of abstraction in front. VTubing, the one we saw, you know, really allows people to explore different identities outside of their own, which is exciting. Gender, race, sexual orientation, political alignment, you name it. Which is great that people have that space to explore that. But as a community, what will our expectations be of authenticity of the people on our screens? One comforting fact, I think, is that we have a high demand of authenticity from our human YouTubers, and our virtual YouTubers, it's basically the same. And so that means that kind of robotic, static, scripted bots will likely be dismissed. They will not rise in popularity just because they're a robot. People still demand an enticing, engaging, relatable performance. So I think in the short term, that's going to act as kind of a check and balance to protect us a little bit. So I'm cautiously optimistic. There's a lot happening in this space, but I think it's definitely one to watch, and it's going to be an exciting decade ahead of us. <laughs>